have Dr. Monica Arienzo joining us today, and she is going to start off by introducing herself, uh, what she does at DRI, and a little bit about her science story, where it all began for her. Excellent. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to get a chance to share a little bit about my my work and what I'm doing up here at DRI. Uh, my name is Monica Arienzo, and I am a professor at uh, DRI, and I'm in the Division of Hydrologic Sciences. Um, and a little bit about my back, my science story. Um, I've always been really interested in science, but I didn't know what part of science I was interested in. And I went to college and I knew I wanted to major in something science related. And I kind of switched between a couple of majors, but I really realized I wanted to become a geologist uh, when the summer before my senior year of college, so kind of getting to the end of my college career, I had the opportunity to participate in a research project in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So this was in the Caribbean. Uh, we were scuba diving every day for, I was there for about a month, and we were trying to understand how humans had impacted the coral reefs. And so you can imagine, right, here you are, I, you know, I was in college, kind of really, you know, exploring science, but not sure what I wanted to do. And I had this chance to go scuba diving in the, in the Caribbean, learning about doing research and learning about the natural world. That's quite an amazing experience. And so I came back to school in the fall and I told my advisor I wanted to be a geologist. I wanted to get my PhD. And she, I was really lucky, I had a very supportive mentor um, and she helped to make sure that I could complete my, my degree, which, you know, meant I had to waive a class, <laughs> but it all worked out. I got my, uh, my undergrad degree and she helped me make sure that I could get into grad school. And I was just really lucky to have that amazing mentor to help me through that, that last bit of the process. So I just wanna share quickly a photo, let's see. So here, hopefully you can all see, this is a photo of me scuba diving. Um, and so this is sort of, I wanted to show this because it kind of exemplifies why this was such a, a transformative experience. So here I'm scuba diving um, and, uh, and you can see there's a tape down here on the corals. And this is by dive buddy Dana, who's a, a friend of mine that I still keep in touch with. And I'm measuring the different corals on the, on the, on the reef bottom. And you can see this day, a, a dolphin came to visit us and wanted to see what we were doing on the coral reef. So, you know, as a, as a college student, getting that opportunity was really amazing and uh, quite, quite transformative. I bet. So today we're talking about the science phenomena that can be used to develop increase, increase skills in the classroom. Can you tell us one phenomena that you study in your work as a scientist? Yeah, it's a great question. So. I wanted to start with talking a little bit about some of the observations I first made about this. So when I was, um, you know, walking along the Truckee River or driving along, you know, the highways here or even hiking in the mountains in remote areas, I noticed that there would be trash in these areas where people weren't. And this could, you know, this could be little things like a wrapper or bigger things like plastic bags all the way up to big styrofoam coolers and I find these in places in remote places and I started wondering what happens to all of this trash right it must go somewhere because we don't have mountains of trash everywhere and so at the heart of this is that every year since the 1950s we humans have produced more synthetic particles plastic sorry synthetic plastics that aren't biodegradable and so every year we create more and more and more of this plastic material. It's not biodegradable, so it's gotta go somewhere. And so I wanted to just quickly share some photos that um, we've been really lucky to have. Uh, either, these are some photos that have come out in the news recently. 
and uh, shared by some of our friends. So this is, uh, the middle photo here is showing some of the trash that they collected in Lake Tahoe. This is through the League to Save Lake Tahoe that's done uh, beach cleanups. And you can just see the amount of trash that they found in the beaches after uh, 4th of July, for example. And you can see a lot of that trash is plastic. This, in, on the uh, right-hand side, is a balloon that got trapped in a bush. And so this is one of my um, favorite examples of plastic trash, because most people don't realize that those mylar balloons you buy are plastic. And you let them go, and then, well, they end up in remote places and pollute our environment. And then down here in the bottom uh, left corner, those of you who are in Reno, you might remember this winter we had uh, an RGJ article about how people would come and go sledding and then their sleds would break and they just leave them. Well, what happens to all of that plastic? So in this photo here, um, this was a really nice photo that actually one of our volunteers took for us. Her name's Laura. And she took photos of trash she found in, one of, in, her, uh, in her site that she was uh, helping us study. And she circled with the green circle in each photo the trash she found. So it's a little hard to see, but these are, uh, these are pieces of trash that are basically tracked in grass. And so now, you know, we went from talking about sort of this big, you know, like the sleds, the plastic sleds, right, the big trash. Now we're starting to see that there is this smaller trash in the environment. And in fact, when we start looking more and more um, closer to our, um, to our natural world, we find that there are these tiny, tiny bits of plastics. And so here you can see this is my hand down here. So this is looking at the photo on the left side. Um, I'm holding a glass jar and in there is a little piece of styrofoam floating in the, in the jar. And so that little piece of styrofoam, I've circled it in red, is, mic is a microplastic. So a microplastic is anything smaller than the size of a sesame seed. And so you can see here on this uh, photo on the right, this is also an example of microplastics. So those big plastic uh, pieces of trash that we see are breaking down into smaller and smaller bits. And so I look at the phenomenon of these synthetic plastics in our environment. When and when these, when these plastics break down, they get into these very small particles. They can be as small as bacteria and some research is showing they can be even smaller. And they can be transported in our water and move all throughout our waterways. And so that's the phenomenon I study. I like that example of the sesame seed. That's, that's a good perspective and a great picture. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, um, why is this phenomenon a good example of the skills needed to figure it out? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so, the, so it's the, the good example of the skills. So skills um, needed to figure this out um, would include things like um, observational skills, laboratory skills, and statistics skills. So um, observational skills sort of range, right? We might look for places that we can sample for microplastics. So it could be as simple as, you know, walking along the river and looking for a place where we can sample for microplastics. But we also use micro, uh, observational skills to look for these microplastics. So just like I showed you in that jar, right, we're looking in our samples to see if we find microplastics. So as an example of um, sort of where we're working, um, this here is a photo of uh, Emerald Bay. And this is all of us researchers sitting here in Emerald Bay doing our research. So this is sort of an example of how we use sort of our observational skills to pick these locations and then go and do our sampling. Um, the next uh, skill would be um, inquiry and sort of experimental skills. So we develop a lot of new tools. So we ask questions about uh, how can we make things better for the scientific community. Um, so for example, with this project, and, and this is the, the approach we're using here in our, in our Emerald Bay example, um, the typical methods that they use to sample microplastics are quite expensive and difficult to implement. And, um, and so what we developed was a cheaper, uh, more lightweight uh, way to sample for microplastics. 
And our hope is that by introducing a cheaper and easier method that we can get even more people to study microplastics. And then lastly, the skill we use would be statistics. So when we measure, micro, measure for microplastics, we want to know is there a statistic, statistical difference between sites, um, maybe different sites, between sites and things like that. And so as an example of that, I wanted to show you some work we've been doing in Las Vegas. So for those of you who are located down in Las Vegas, we traveled down there um, uh, twice in 2018 to sample uh, the Las Vegas wash. So this is the water that drains from Las Vegas into Lake Mead. And these are four different sites that we measured microplastics in. And those bars represent how many microplastics we found. And so a statistics question we might ask is, is this first site here statistically different than the second one? And is, the, is are those different than the third and the fourth? And so we can use statistics to help us back up our findings and help us to, um, to be able to draw conclusions and say what is statistically significant. In terms of kids, I guess in your opinion, why do you why should care, kids care about this topic? Yeah, that's a great question. I, yeah, I've been studying microplastics for about three years now, and the thing that's really struck me about studying this is it's a, it's a local issue and a global issue. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, a great, a great thing for ch kids to be motivated about and to care about. You know, locally, we found microplastics in our waters um, in here in Reno, and then like I showed you in Las Vegas as well. We've also found them in snow up in uh, up near Lake Tahoe. Um, and so, you know, I would argue that it's important to study plastic as uh, these are man-made materials and they are persisting in our environment. And, um, and they can, studies have shown that they can negatively impact wildlife. Um, we don't know yet if they can impact human health. I think that there's still some work that needs to be done in that area. Um, but one concern, for example, is that a chemical or a microbe might attach onto the piece of plastic and then it can be ingested by a human or by an animal and then that could then cause um, negative health effects. So we still have a lot of work to do um, and like the poll, Megan, uh, created in the beginning really nicely showed is that, you know, we still have a lot of work to do to reduce microplastics, but the best thing each individual can do is reduce single use plastics in their daily lives. Great, that is important. Um, the next question is, um, talk about patterns. Like what is the pattern that you study related to this phenomena? So the pattern I study is uh, trying to understand where, where are microplastics in our freshwater environments. And this is really important because plastics have a range of density. So what this means is that some plastics will float in water and some plastics will sink. So this makes studying plastics difficult, but it also makes it really, really interesting and fun as a scientist. So, um, so for example, if you think of, uh, if you're familiar, for example, with uh, Winnie the Pooh and Pooh Bear's game of poo sticks. Uh, and if you're not, if you don't remember, that's okay. Uh, I'll remind you. <laughs> this is when Pooh Bear and his friends tossed sticks off of one side of the bridge and then ran to the other side to see who's crossed the bridge first. And they, they uh, it w went into a stream below them. And they also threw a rock off of the bridge. And so what, you know, as we know, different sticks are going to be traveling at different rates, right? And this is gonna depend on what the, the sort of what the stick is like, like how rough is it? Does it have a kink in it? Um, and it's also gonna, and it also depends on the course of the river itself. And so, and, um, and in contrast, right? If we throw a rock, it's just gonna sink to the bottom. So, um, and so this is very similar to when we think about plastics, right? Some of our plastics are like the rock. They're gonna just sink because they're dense. 
But in contrast, a lot of our plastics are like the sticks. They're going to float, and they're going to float at different rates down the river depending on their, you know, their own composition in the course of the river itself. And so um, going back to your question about the patterns I look at, um, I want to know where are these plastics being found and what patterns can we find and where they are located. So, um, you know, in Reno Sparks, we might want to know about the Truckee River. So are those plastics sinking to the bottom and not, not going down downstream? Or are they traveling downstream and maybe they're getting stuck somewhere and we can find them somewhere else? Um, and similarly, we can ask the same questions about the Lake Mead watershed. Great. Um, what is it about this phenomena that provides investigable questions? That's a great question. Um, and I, I think that what makes this phenomenon, what makes this, what makes it, what, what about this then provides investable questions is that there's a lot of different elements that can be looked at here. So I've already described kind of how plastic density can, can um, vary depending on the type of plastic. Um, and so I think that, um, provides investigable questions. <laughs> um, and, you know, we can also ask, we can also think about questions related to the river itself. So the, the transport vehicle, the mechanism that we're moving these plastics. Um, there's all sorts of other things, you know, we can look at, including things like what is inputting into the river. So are there other streams? Is there snow coming in? Um, is there, you know, um, a big trash source nearby? And so all of these different dimensions make it possible to investigate a lot of different questions. And I think as it's relevant to the, the teachers here, you know, you can think about the, these questions can have, um, not only do they have, uh, there are a lot of questions we can ask, but they can also be um, scale to different sort of classroom environments. So if this is an elementary school age, Right, there are a lot of questions we can ask appropriate for that sort of um, that that kid, and then we can ask questions that are more appropriate for the older students as well. Great. In your career, I'm sure you've generated many research questions. What do you think makes a good research question, and what are some common errors? <laughs> this is a great question, and I feel like I'm still learning how to answer these how to ask good questions, um, as my proposal reviewers sometimes like to remind me. <laughs> but, you know, I think, um, you know, the basics that I always recommend that my students think about is, you know, a good question is one that you can test, right? We know this. Uh, we want to be able to answer it by direct observations. So, for example, we can, we can count the number of plastics that are floating versus how many plastics are sunk in a river, right? That's something we can we can ask a question and we can test that. Another question, um, another good, a good question does not rely on assumptions or knowledge gaps. So uh, for example, when we want to study uh, plastics of different density, uh, we rely on the known information, right? That we know that certain, the density of certain plastics. And so we, we, um, we rely on that known information. We're not making any assumptions about the densities of plastics. We have that known information. Um, and I always like to remind my students that a good question as, um, for all of us is questions that are relevant to society and to the scientific community, as well as the larger, you know, global community. And, you know, that's the other reason why, as an environmentalist, I really like studying microplastics because I think it's important for society as well as for the scientific community to study them. And then lastly, um, a good question is one that is able to be answered given the resources that are available. So this is probably the biggest, um, you know, um, sort of the biggest sticking point for a lot of um, young, you know, young early career scientists I see. Um, you know, you'll start with a question like, I want to solve microplastic pollution for the whole world, right? Okay, well, like, that's not really doable for, you know, for me, I, I mentor a lot of undergraduate and graduate students, you know, 
that's not doable in a short time frame, whether it be a semester long project or a five year PhD. So um, I think is able, you know, being able to formulate a question that you can feasibly answer with the resources is really important. And, um, you know, I think number four is probably the hardest for me still, because <laughs> I want to answer those really big questions. And sometimes I have a hard time narrowing it down to a, a doable question. <laughs> Good to think big, though. <laughs> you mentioned mentoring. So a big part of your job is mentoring these future scientists and teaching people how to think. What advice do you have for to help students move from just memorizing things to asking questions to figure something out? Yeah, I think this is a really important point. And, you know, I think I was definitely more taught in the, like, memorize things way. <laughs> um, and I think I still see, you know, a lot of our undergraduates still really struggle with this. I think they want to, they want the answer quickly and they want to be able to memorize it. Whereas, you know, what we do, we don't know what the answer is. And, um, and so, you know, we don't, you know, I guess when I do science, I, yeah, I'm in my office right now, but most of the time when I, I'm thinking about questions I want to ask. I'm making observations. And for me as a geologist, a lot of those observations are coming from the natural world. And then, you know, like I said earlier, I'm a big picture, I'm a big question person, and then I have to narrow them down to make sure that they are, um, you know, re can be reasonably addressed. <laughs> um, so I usually have students do a similar approach. I have my students start with observations. So I recently um, had an undergrad start in my lab as a sophomore in, coll in college. So she was still very new to this process of how to ask questions. And what I, you know, process we had her go through was um, she had collected some data and then I had her look at the data and just spend one week and I, was really trying to encourage her to just be creative and play with the data see what you know what can you find and you know you have these tools you know about statistics and you know about you know how to plot things and and just play with it and make some observations and see what comes out at you and so i gave her the assignment of listing five observations and then five questions she still had about those observations and so, um, and so then, you know, this is then where I came back in and kind of helped her formulate those questions. And then, um, and then, you know, we went from there. Um, and that, that seemed to work pretty well. Um, you know, I'm really lucky I get to work one on one with my students. And I know most people in this room, you know, don't get that one on one <laughs> with their student. But um, I think, you know, observations is a really great place to start and trying to formulate questions from there. Great. We had a few questions um, that teachers asked ahead of time and I was going to ask a couple of them. Um, one of them is, um, is there anything students would be able to do as an experiment to illustrate this problem, um, how it occurs or how to combat it? That's a great question. Um, so we, um, we will be sharing with you all some activities we've made, um, specifically looking at the exploring the density of plastics. I think um, that's maybe sort of like elementary, middle school level, and it's really, uh, especially with everyone being at home now, it's kind of a fun way to learn about density and, and learn about how even at home we have plastics that uh, will float and some that will sink in water. So that's really nice. Uh, and then you can even use different, you know, you don't have to use water, you can use liquids of different density. So that's a really nice um, sort of experiment. It doesn't necessarily illustrate the problem of microplastics, but it at least gets uh, students exploring a little bit. Um, some other things I would, I always recommend doing, and I've done this myself, and it's really uh, quite interesting and you learn a lot about yourself as I, um, I collected um, single use plastics that I used in one week. Um, you know, I had friends that would like, like make a single use plastic necklace or whatever, right? You know, however you want to do it, but uh, you could even just keep a note, a log of like every single use piece of single use plastic you use. 
And it's amazing how much you use and discard in a week. And even like when you're trying to conscientiously not do it, there's still so much plastic, you know, like you buy something at the grocery store that's wrapped in plastic, like, oh, you know. <laughs> so that was, that's another really fun way to kind of think about um, your impact beyond, um, beyond yourself. Um, and then the other one I always like to recommend is that everyone take a look at the, um, the tags on their clothing. Um, you'd be amazed, you know, uh, the, I love my stretchy pants, right? They're <laughs> really comfortable. <laughs> um, but the stretchiness comes from it being made out of plastic. And so I think um, for, you know, another really fun activity is just to look at the tags on your clothing and Google what they're made out of. And it's pretty amazing how much of it's plastic. <laughs> That's very relevant to kids today. They're stretchy pants. That's great connection. Um, speaking of students, is it possible for students or a class or classes to participate in one of your research projects? Um, for example, collecting, reading, analyzing data, running trails, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Um, totally, yes. Um, I currently write, well, but pre-COVID, I had a high school student in my, in my lab and he was looking at looking for microplastics under the microscope. So he was taking photos under the microscope, and then we would talk about what he was he was looking at. Um, and I, you know, when you study a topic that's, um, you know, been in the news and people are aware of it, like microplastics, I think it's really. Um, you know, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to engage students in the scientific process and learn about what we're doing. So. Yeah, and we're always interested in thinking up new ideas and, um, you know, and we're open to hearing if you all have any ideas of ways we could in engage students. Um, yeah, we're totally, we're totally excited about that and would love to do that. That would be awesome. That's great. <laughs> Um, Megan, do you have some, so this, so teachers, if you have some questions, this is the time you can click the chat button and ask a question and Megan will either call on you to ask it. So you have to unmute yourself and turn on your video so we can see. Um, I know sometimes that takes a little bit of time or she can ask it for you. So we will move to, uh, teacher questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I have, there are a number of questions in the chat that deal with the impacts of microplastics as an emerging contaminant. Um, but I'm going to first pull a question from the, the registration questions that I think will segue really nicely to the questions in the chats. And so the question is, what threats do microplastics pose to human, animal, and plant life? And then we can dig into that question of toxicity a little bit more. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, um, I didn't, I didn't, I kind of skipped over that part a little bit. Um, so with any emerging contaminant, you know, we're always still learning more about it. And I think right now with microplastics, we are learning a lot more about it. Um, and there's still a lot to be done. So as far as the toxicity, um, we know it is, it, you know, we know large pieces of plastic for sure can be harmful if ingested. Um, right, it can result in choking. Um, you can have abrasions and uh, other like gastrointestinal issues. So we know that, and that makes sense, right? When we think about uh, ingesting a large particle. Um, when we talk about, you know, when we get into the smaller microplastics, we don't really know. Um, there are studies that have been done looking at the impacts of microplastics on. Um, uh, clams and mussels, um, trying to understand what happens to them. And there's some indication that microplastics can have a negative effect. Um, uh, so I think we're still learning. I think um, one of the areas which I think is really interesting, um, and the, I think the research is really interesting, is, um, is if a chemical or a microbe is stuck onto the microplastic that then that gets eaten. So if that happens, then when that microplastic enters the, the body of the animal, um, that uh, chemical or microbe or whatever else will now enter into the body of that animal. And so that is potentially one way 
um, that they can be harmful. So maybe the plastic itself isn't a problem, but it, maybe the problem is actually whatever is stuck onto the plastic. Um, and so, and then as far as human health impacts, um, we just don't know that yet. So um, we don't know uh, if microplastics are in our drinking water. Uh, we don't know, uh, you know, we don't know if there's a human health impact I, do, I don't think that there probably is a significant human health impact because if we think about it, plastics are used so often, right? We use them in the medical world all the time to, you know, if you've ever gone, had to get an IV, right? Everything's plastic. And so is there a potential human health effect? There might be, but I would be surprised if it was really, um, if there was a serious health effect. Thank you. So um, we have a question from Sonia. She's going to ask about one specific area of testing. You feel free to go beyond to explain what you have tested. Sonia Foster, are you there and want to ask yes. your question? Yes. Oh, yep. I, I, you were just talking about it, if you had tested tap water yet. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, we have not tested tap water yet. Um, currently, Cal state of California is considering a microplastic um, drink level for drinking water and so in that case there would be a lot more testing happening. Um, I'm really interested in that and that's something um, that we've been talking about how we can do that and what that would look like and what the process would be. Um, so yeah I, it's a great question and something definitely really interested in looking into in the future. And, and one other to go on. I'm on well water. Mm -hmm. So do they have, when they do testing on well water, is that part of it or is it another specific test we'd have to request? So currently there is no like approved testing for um, microplastics in water. So when you do send your, you know, I also am on a well and so we send our water to the lab, it gets tested, right? Those are certified labs that have certified procedures. So they follow very strict guidelines. Um, they're regulated at the uh, federal level uh, by the EPA. Uh, and so that way, if you send it to one lab or, or another lab, you should always get the same answer. And that's why they do that. So currently there is no um, standardized method for microplastic testing in water. Um, part of what California is trying to do with, uh, with setting uh, regulations for drinking water is establish that methodology. So yeah, um, so stay tuned. Maybe someday in the future we'll be able to offer that. Um, but I do think the question about well waters um, is a really, really interesting question. And um, yeah, something hopefully in the future we'll be able to do. Wonderful. Susan Ritter, do you want to ask your question? I was just wondering if you just study, have been studying the water in Nevada or if you've had anything to do in any action working with the ocean plastics. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so we have only been looking at, for microplastics locally uh, within uh, Nevada. So just looking at plastics in Lake Tahoe, the Truckee River, Las Vegas Wash, and Lake Mead. Um, I, uh, you bring up a great point though that I also didn't talk about, but um, one of the big concerns is ocean microplastics. So if you've um, seen any information out there about the, uh, the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch, so it's a gar it's uh, basically within one of the gyres in the oceans. And this, so this is where the currents of the oceans have basically f uh, pushed all of the trash into a giant garbage patch basically in the in the middle of our ocean and um, and so there's a lot of the concern about if you know these we can physically we can see it right we can see it from space so these are very large pieces of trash uh, but the concern is that that could be breaking down and being coming a source for microplastics for the rest of the ocean on top of all of the other human impacts from land into the ocean so yes I think um, the study of microplastics in the ocean is really interesting. Um, we just decided to ch choose fresh waters because we're in a landlocked state. <laughs> so that's why we focused on that. And plus, you know, it's the fresh waters are important because it's our drinking water. So that's why we wanted to focus on that. But 
the ocean plastics is a really interesting question. Awesome. I'm going to ask a question from the registration list of questions. It's going to segue nicely to some of the questions that uh, teachers have asked. The question is, um, um, what are some ways to prevent microplastics from getting into the water? Yeah, so what are some ways to prevent microplastics? Um, is it, that was the question? Yeah. So um, the best thing to do is limit use of single-use plastics. Um, I think we're still the, you know, the science itself is still developing. So I think exactly what are the biggest sources to the environment, we don't quite know yet. And we're really hoping to be able to provide, you know, people in Reno with information about the number one biggest source of microplastics to the Truckee River is tire wear and tear, whatever it might be. Um, and so we would really like to be able to do that. We're just not quite there yet with the science. Um, but I think, you know, biggest thing, you know, as an individual you could do is just reduce single use plastics. So that's things like, um, you know, reuse your, your coffee mugs. So bring your coffee mugs to the uh, cafe, right? Instead of taking theirs that might have that plastic cap on it. Um, you know, make sure that if you do use plastics, you're putting it in the trash and not leaving it out, right? Going back to what we talked about in the very beginning of it sitting out in the environment where then it can break down into smaller and smaller bits of plastic. Um, and there's like, there's just so many really neat products out there these days um, to as plastic alternatives. So, um, you know, one of my big, um, I think one of the big eyesores I tend to see in the environment are styrofoam coolers. Um, especially up in Tahoe, you know, you'll, they fly off, you know, people, someone puts it on the roof of their car and drives away and it blows off and sits on the side of the road and just breaks into millions of tiny little pieces of styrofoam or it falls off the boat or something. Um, and so there's really neat alternatives out there. I just saw this week, um, the company Igloo is, for example, making a biodegradable um, cooler. So there's so many cool, really neat alternatives that don't use plastics that are out there now. Um, you know, even little things like the shampoo bottles, right? They now make um, bars of, of shampoo instead. Like these are little things that can actually make a really big difference. So, um, and then, you know, the other things I would, um, the other big things I would recommend, um, cigarette butts are made of plastic and that came up in the poll. So the cigarette butts are made out of uh, acetate, cellulose acetate and rayon. And so make sure, you know, you dispose of those properly. A lot of people, uh, especially up at Lake Tahoe, we've seen, they like to stick their cigarette butts into the sand. And that's probably in the worst place to put it because it's just going to get ground down into tiny, tiny bits of plastic. Um, and then lastly, um, the washing cycle is potential is also a big source of microplastics. So when we wash our clothing, right, um, you know, I'm wearing this top here is totally made out of plastic, right, and I'll wash it when I get home. But in the process of washing it, it will create little tiny bits of plastic. And then when your washing machine then dumps that water, right, that's getting into our waterways as well. Um, and then similarly, so, you know, there are options out there for bags you can buy to put your synthetics in, um, or you can just wash your clothes less often. I mean, these days, right, we're all at home anyways. <laughs> Nobody can smell me. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I always recommend, we always recommend, um, you know, you can hang dry your synthetic clothing as well. So you don't have to put it through the dryer, which is another way that microplastics can be getting out into the environment. So um, yeah, it's so nice out these days, just hang the clothes outside. Perfect. Next question is from Anna Rada. Are you there? Sorry, my trick wasn't working. Um, I think she kind of covered it already. I was I was asking what, um, for example, is there a type of plastic that you're finding more often and and are you able to trace that plastic back to the source? Like, is it mostly from, like you said, like from tire tread or from water bottles or 
why yep, not? That's a great question. And I don't think we're quite there yet to answer that question, but I was reading an article about um, plastics they found in the San Francisco Bay. And so that would be kind of a similar sort of situ situation to what we have here. Um, it's probably a little more, you know, more urbanized in the community surrounding San Francisco Bay than we have, but it could be um, kind of a comparable sort of comparison. Um, and there, interestingly, they did find, um, they found fibers were very present in their water there. Um, and so fibers would be derived potentially from clothing. And so that was really interesting and that kind of leads to questions then about can we do things about the washing process? So one proposal they had in their in their um, project summary was to that the city of uh, or the, the counties should require that washing machines have little filters at their outlet and that that could then capture those fibers. So um, that's really interesting. Um, some studies have been coming out showing that tire uh, rubbers are, are very present in our waterways as well. And the thought there is that it has to do with tire wear and tear. So as our tires, right, um, where does all, where does that tire rubber go? <laughs> it's so, you know, so once you start thinking about it, you're like, oh yeah, like this much of my tire wears away every, you know, however often I have to replace them, where does it go? Um, and so they've been looking in storm drainages near highways and they've been finding these little beads of rubber in there. Um, and so that is one potential um, source as well that I think we're going to hear more about as the science develops. Yeah, that's really interesting. I never thought about the tires. I was always, you know, thinking about things that we use, but yeah, that, so that's great. I never, never would have thought of that one. Yeah, I know. Me neither until someone brought it up like, oh yeah. <laughs> So there are a couple questions about, you mentioned processes of breakdown of tires and clothing, but a couple breakdown, uh, a couple other questions about the breakdown process. Janie, do you want Janie Sherwood, do you want to ask your question about that? See if there's any other uh, channels to break down um, that I want to go on to talk about. Yeah, here I am. Uh, hi. Yeah, I guess it's just following up on what you already just spoke about. But I'm just wondering, you know, how quickly, say, because in my mind, too, it's like water bottles and the plastic containers that, you know, the strawberries are in. Um, how long does it take for those containers to turn into microplastics? That's a great question. So I don't, I don't know if anyone's done the calculation for the time to, to form microplastics. But we do know that things like um, exposure to sunlight or UV light, that that will increase um, the, the degradation time. So for example, at my house, um, I, uh, in my garden, I was storing um, some stuff in some like, you know, five gallon buckets and I just had it sitting out there and it was sitting out there, you know, since last summer, right? And so I went to pick up the bucket and it just started crumbling into these, you know, bits of, you know, Yes, I'm keeping myself employed, right? <laughs> um, and, and the reason why that happened is because the, that container had been exposed to UV light and that UV light causes the plastic to just kind of get very brittle and break into these little tiny, tinier microplastics much more easily than it would otherwise. Um, so we, I don't know uh, exactly the time it would take, but we do know that things like exposure to UV light, we know that, um, wave action. So if you have a, a plastic water bottle that's located, you know, on the shore of Lake Tahoe or in the, on the beach where there's waves that are going to be um, sort of um, smashing against that plastic, then we know that that wave action can break it down. And then abrasion. So um, if we think back to, you know, the cigarette butt that someone sticks into the sand, right, someone then walks over that sand then that abrasion process, all those sand grains are then going to help break down that micro, that, um, that cigarette butt into microplastics. So we have been seeing more work being done at looking at all these different processes and how they how they result in creating microplastics. Um, but I yeah we just we just I haven't heard much about time, but it's a really good question. 
Nice. Now that we've talked about the mechanisms to break down, Christina Stark has a question about taking that into the classroom. Christina? So I was thinking about this as well, and it would be kind of fun to have students take different types of plastics. And could they use something maybe like a rock tumbler to see how long it would take to break them down? And, and would a rock tumbler work? It sounds like it might. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Totally, yeah. I can picture how a rock tumbler would work. So you have um, like a drum and you put your microplastics in there or your plastics in there. And then you could you would add your sand or whatever you're going to use as your abrasive um, additive. And then you would start your rock tumbler. And then you could open it up after a certain amount of time and look inside and see, you know, are those plastics, you know, if you put your Lego piece in it, what does it come out looking like afterwards? And it's not going to probably look the same. So totally, I think that's a great idea um, to as a way to, to look at abrasion. To, definitely. Yeah. It's a great idea. Great. Kathy Zuber, you want to ask your question? If you're muted, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, I will go ahead and ask. So Kathy asks, we all like to be, buy stretchy techy clothes that are made from recycled plastics. Do you want to expand on, you talked a little bit about synthetics, but maybe um, some of the work that you're doing looking at micro, those plastic microfibers in the environment? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we all love Love that stretchy clothing, right? Love, I wear a lot of like the athletic kind of moisture wicking clothing. Um, and so I, there's a lot of really interesting questions about, about this, um, about uh, how we can make clothing so that it doesn't shed microplastics. And uh, one of the projects we have is working with REI and REI um, is, the outdoor com uh, outdoor company so they make clothing they buy clothing from other companies and sell it through their stores um and so they're really interested because uh from their perspective they recognize that their consumer base tend to be environmentalists who are going to be aware of the problem of microplastics and so um from their perspective, you know, they're really interested in if we could design, you know, if they can design a jacket that doesn't shed microplastics, then that would um, benefit, you know, their company and also benefit the environment. Um, and so with REI, we've been also looking at the question of if, um, if uh, clothes dryers are a source of microplastics. So we, if we stick our synthetic clothing in, in a dryer, we turn the dryer on, right? We'll, we'll get something in the, in the lint trap, right? We'll clean the lint trap afterwards and we'll see what's in there. Um, but the lint trap's only gonna capture a, a percentage of the total plastic that's generated from drying our clothes. And so the rest of that that gets past the lint trap is gonna go out and, and go through your, your um, your vent, your dryer vent. And so that's usually on the outside of your house. Um, and some, in some cases, you know, you might go near your dryer vent and you'll find lint sitting around the dryer vent. Um, and so potentially that lint contains microplastics, but no one's actually ever tested that before. And so one thing we've been doing with REI is trying to find a way, can we somehow capture that, that material that's coming out of the vent? And then we're also interested in seeing if that stuff that's coming out of the vent is plastic. Awesome. Chrissy's got a question that uh, came up. Kind of the magic question that came up a lot in our stakeholder interviews. Um, Chrissy, do you want to ask your question about consumers and behavior change? Um, I know that this is getting a lot of attention right now. We know about the issues involved with the plastics and microplastics. Um, there's big movements out there like Break Free from Plastic, the new documentary, The Story of Plastic. So people are aware of the problems, but how do we get them to move from caring enough about those problems to change their purchasing behaviors away from convenience and more towards sustainability? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'm really lucky. I work with a lot of really smart people who know a lot about how to change how to change people's behaviors and they study this. Um, and so they have told me, <laughs> this was all new to me, um, education is, is really one of the best ways to do that. So, um, you know, if you've seen um, the signs up in Tahoe, there's the, the Take Care Tahoe uh, group, and they create these really clever signs. Uh, they have one right now, it's go big on social distancing, and it shows like a biker. I and a I do, driver. but I don't think it's on. Oh. Can you guys hear me? Are you good? Okay. Um, Hello. So, um, so you know, if in order to help change behaviors, creating uh, some sort of educational campaign with a group like that um, would be a great way to do it. Um, that I know that the group up at UC Davis, up at Lake Tahoe, um, the Tahoe Environmental Research Center, they've been talking a lot about how to um, you know, promote um, reusable plastic bottle or reusable bottles and instead of plastic bottles in places like um, the grocery store, for example. So making it easy for people to make those choices um, also can really help as well. Yeah, and so Megan just put in the chat uh, for everyone that um, Take Care Tahoe link. And so they're a really great group that does some really clever messaging for environmental issues. And so hopefully someday we'll get to work with them and, and get them to help us move the public perception around plastics as well. Monica, you've done a lot of um, news and educational interviews. What are some of the things that you find are either common myths or things that you really just want the public to know about uh, solutions to microplastics that maybe you haven't mentioned? Or um, since we just have a couple minutes left, I thought I'd leave you the, the option to um, say, give one last thought. Um, so I guess, I think one of the big um, take home message that I would uh, I would love for all of you to take away from this is, you know, this is a, a, a topic that's gained a lot of interest recently, but we don't have all the answers yet. And so for students, um, you know, that's so exciting. And it's literally, it's one of those questions, it's one of those topics that literally any question you ask can help, help solve the problem of microplastics and help us better understand microplastics. And how often, you know, I, I just feel like there's so many opportunities out there and um, I think it's a really exciting field to be in. I'm excited when I see students getting excited about it. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm not going to solve it. <laughs> My generation probably won't solve it, but you know, the, our students will be the ones to solve it. I'm certain of that. Um, and so I think it's a really, it's a really interesting topic and I think that um, yeah, there's just so many questions left out there that there's so many opportunities. Mm -hmm.